Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Hello, and welcome back to the Sound Bites Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Joy Dobbins, a registered dietitian nutritionist. And on the show, we delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. And today's episode is all about food bullying. My guest, Michelle Payne, brings clarity and common sense to the emotional food conversation. As one of North America's leading voices in connecting farm and food, Michelle helps you simplify safe food choices. And we're going to talk more about her background and credentials. But welcome to the show, Michelle. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here, Melissa. Well, thanks for coming back to the show because you were on a previous episode, episode number 61, Food Truths from Farm to Table. And we talked about your book by the same title. That was your second book. And your first book was No More Food Fights. Your new book, Food Bullying, How to Avoid Buying BS is just coming out and I pre-ordered my copy and it will probably show up on my doorstep tomorrow, but I've seen the preview information and worked with you ahead of time to kind of get up to speed. But yeah, I'm really excited to have you back on the show. Your other episode was very popular, very well received by my listeners, and I'm really excited about this topic. And before we dive into the book and this topic, tell us a little bit about your background. I know that you have spent your whole lifetime on the farm. So I'd like you to tell us about that. And you're a certified speaking professional. So if you could kind of share like, what made you interested in this whole farm to food or food to farm conversation, and sort of kind of clarifying a lot of the misinformation out there? Well, I happen to love chocolate, wine and cows. So those three things work together very well for the farm and food conversation. I am a lifetime farm girl and have spent my entire career working in agriculture, most notably the last 18 years, and trying to connect the worlds of food and farm as both a professional speaker and now an author. And the reason why this is so important to me is because I believe people have been misled about their food and about farming. And The reason why I wrote Food Bullying and the other books was to try to bring perspective as to what's happening in the food conversation. So today I still have cows out in my front yard. My daughter and I uh, enjoy showing registered Holsteins. I also like to indulge in a glass of red wine and some chocolate. So I have to go to the gym and do all those sorts of things. But really what I think about the farm and food perspective, what I think is context and community and being able to help people truly understand that food should be about celebration, not condemnation. Yes, absolutely. Now, bullying is a household term. My son is 11 years old, so we hear about bullying all the time. I'm wondering, what is food bullying? And of course, we're going to talk about all of those aspects and and what we can do about it. But let's kind of set the stage with what is food bullying? Who's doing the bullying? Who are the victims? And of course, we're going to talk about everything that people can find in your book as well. Let's start with what is food bullying, because clearly a lot of people don't know what food bullying is. Essentially, at the end of the day, food bullying removes choice from people in food and in farming. There's any number of examples in the food bullying book that range from an anti-hunger advocate who couldn't afford food for her toddler son when she was homeless to a farmer in Germany who was attacked online by animal rights activists, to a student in Australia who received a shaming note for taking homemade birthday cake that was left over in her school lunchbox. So the reality is, is that food bullying happens around the plate. It's often not intentional. Uh, The problem is, is that bullying has become a social academic that has become acceptable, frankly. It's okay to shame people on their eating choices, but it's not okay to shame people on their race, religion, or sexuality. And my question is why? Food is a basic necessity. It should not be an opportunity for manipulation. 
And I strongly believe it's time to elevate the food conversation above the bull speak, which is the BS in the subtitle of the book of how to avoid buying BS. Um, and it's really time to take food away from that bull speak and help people understand that they shouldn't be feeling bad about their eating choices. You, you mentioned BS, bull speak. Why this term? Is there uh, some background behind that? The reason behind bull speak is that I'm not going to cuss at people, but I really do believe that there's a lot of bull speak on the packages that are happening around food, whether it's ethically raised or whether it's uh, something that promises cleansing, which I know is one of your favorite things, Melissa, um, <laughs> to and sustainable. My question is, is that measurable and meaningful about every label? And in most cases, it's not. So on average, the grocery store has 40,000 products in it. If you consider that there's five labels on every package or five claims on every package, which is conservative, that's 200,000 claims we have to sort through. And that's bull speak in itself, in my opinion. Um, so that was really kind of the context behind the subtitle is that we wanted something that was attention grabbing, but wasn't too insulting. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, because you, you talk about fat free marshmallows, gluten free water, hormone free salt, grass fed peaches, all of these, you know, sort of like you said, is this measurable? Is it meaningful? And there's a little tongue in cheek here, obviously, but some of these claims aren't far off. Like they might actually somehow be accurate, but very misleading. So we're going to talk more about that. You talk about a $5.75 trillion playground and how marketing capitalizes on fear. And I'd like to dig into that a little bit. Obviously, we can't cover everything in your book, but I think that this is really key. So let's talk about that. So the $5.75 trillion playground, if you could imagine grocery stores in one corner of the playground with all of those claims that I talked about, the 200,000 plus claims, and then consider restaurants and another part that are, are making claims on their menus and shaming people into eating, quote, clean food, unquote, which is one of my least favorite terms associated with food. And then when you look at the manufacturers in another corner of the playground and in another corner of the playground are dietitians and yet another corner uh, are farmers and running amok in this playground are bullies. Bullies that are perhaps creating uh, regulation, those that are forcing legislation. And again, food bullying comes down to removing choice by creating fear. So one of the things I wrote about in the food bullying book is the cycle of bullying. And the fact of the matter is, is only 1.5% of our population is on a farm or ranch today. And therefore, people don't know farmers and ranchers for the large part. And you don't trust what you don't know, right? Mm -hmm. So as you don't trust, fear is built, particularly when there are all of these different entities out there making conflicting and differing claims about food, which just adds on to the fear. Bullies prey on fear and the cycle continues. The distrust grows, the fear grows, the bullying grows to the point where people can't make choices without having some emotional consequence. And to me, again, food is a basic necessity. It's nourishment that we should be seeking. It's safety that we should be seeking. It should not be about social status, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you talk about how these claims are attempting to position one food as superior to another. And you share a specific example that I think is really clear. First, you say 60% of Americans say that food labels influence their food purchases, which makes a lot of sense. But consider this scenario in your grocery store. Company X decides to proclaim its chicken is antibiotic free. The general consumer is left to wonder what is wrong with the other chicken? Are there antibiotics in it? And then they ask the question, am I making the right choice? Am I doing the right thing for my family? And this is where all the fear turns into uncertainty and doubt. So are there some other examples that we can share? And I know you share examples and stories in your book, but are there some other specific examples you can share to kind of bring this home? Uh, there sure are. One of the sections of the book that I wrote about were the fairy tales around food, because there have been uh, numerous fairy tales and folklore created. And it goes from the free labels, which I consider to be free from truth, typically. So antibiotic free, GMO free, 
labels that are preservative free and, and so forth. And to me, the reason why those are a fairy tale is because, again, if it's not measurable, it's not meaningful. If you can't define it, then why are we slapping a label on it? And I know many people may be a fan of the GMO free because they want to know what is in their food. But in my mind, when I go out and buy a bag of bell peppers or the small peppers and there are no GMO ingredients in there because it's just straight up peppers and there are no GMO peppers that exist anywhere, a label does not belong in that package. I use the example in Canada, the standards that they had actually created of what was allowable and what was not. And I'm a big fan of that. So that's one example. Another example would be around farm size, the uh, folklore that's been created around the fact that big is bad and small is bucolic. That's a, a fairy tale in itself because the reality is, is that farms of all sizes and shapes are needed to feed people and they're held accountable to different regulations. And frankly, the larger the farm, the more the regulations, the more the, the approval process that they have to go through. And then the final fairy tale that I would hold up as an example is one of my favorites and it's cow farts folklore. And <laughs> I have personal experience of methane from cattle because they do like to burp and they do like to fart. And I put that up tongue in cheek, but when you look at the facts that are out there and the facts that there has been significant improvements in sustainability related to both meat and milk production, and the fact that we as humans have a far greater environmental impact than animal agriculture has ever had just by our transportation and electricity production, it's really interesting when you get behind some of the claims and you start looking at the facts. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that the food bullying removes choice. And I'd like to really talk more specifically about that because that's something that I worry about being supportive of agriculture and different types of agriculture and farmer choice and biotechnology or technology in general. I fear that technologies and types of food that are safe, but are misperceived as not safe could be taken away. And I don't think the average consumer thinks about that. So let's talk about that more. What would that look like? And there have been some examples that have already happened where choices have been taken away. So an example that would come from uh, friends that farm in a neighboring county, and they are uh, actually two PhD scientists super smart people, and they are now growing non-GMO products because they were able to secure a higher contract price for it. And in today's farm economy, that's crucial. If you're not aware, farmers are losing money, working really hard, and very frustrated by the whole process of what's happening. Their choice to grow GMO was removed because of finances. And just so you understand, those fields will now have more chemicals sprayed on them because of the fact that they are not using a GMO product that would protect the plants from different sorts of pests and insects. So when you think about removing choice on the farm level, it comes down to a practice. So one of the items that people perhaps frown on are dehorning calves or castrating cattle or removing tails from pigs. All of those sound gruesome, but when you put context around those, I need that choice as a dairy person to take the horns out of our cattle so they don't hurt my daughter or myself. Uh, likewise, my friends that are hog farmers that are out there making bacon that everyone loves, Pigs are carnivores. They chew on each other if you don't remove the tails. So there's a lot of different practices on a farm that are largely misunderstood. And again, it gets back to the fact that bullying operates from a privileged position and it leverages fear. That fear turns into consumer demand, which pushes the retailers and the restaurant folks to make different claims and whatnot. So in order to break the cycle, we have to acknowledge that the bullying exists. And then we have to be able to know what our own standards are. So just to continue that conversation before we get into some of the solutions, because I know you have a lot of tips on that. It's very well known that companies 
want to differentiate their products so that you choose theirs instead of others. And that's where a lot of this marketing comes in where they're trying to infer superiority yes. over their products. And, you know, it reminds me of way back in the day, you know, we had cholesterol free vegetable oil. <laughs> well, like you said, there are no GMO peppers. Well, there's no cholesterol in vegetable oil because there's no cholesterol in vegetables. Mm -hmm. So again, it can be as basic as that, where it might be true, but not meaningful. Or it could be an example of where, like you said earlier, there's not a clear definition. So it's kind of an ambiguous claim, but it's implied. You mentioned position and power. So let's talk about who is influencing us through the implied power of position, platform, or product. The implied position platform and product is a little bit more complex, but I think it's important to step back and realize that bullying is not always intentional. And at some level, we're all responsible for bullying. Dietitians are responsible for bullying. Farmers are responsible for bullying. Chefs are responsible for bullying. Schools are, teachers are, manufacturers certainly are, retailers are, and whatnot. And what I did is I broke it down into the implied power position. So those are people whose career expertise gives an implied power over others and choices. So for example, if you have a famous chef standing on TV talking about the fact that they believe organic products are the only way to go, and that chef has a huge following, they are going to have an implied power over their viewers, whether it's a scientifically valid fact or not. Likewise, the implied power of platform, people who have a bully pulpit, and gives them implied power over others. So this certainly brings on social media. This brings on the mom groups, the mom bloggers, the fitness gurus, your friends, gym nutritionists, activists, other parents. And when you consider the fact when you're on a mom group, as an example, or if you're a dad and you're in a dad group and a mom starts going off about that you should only be using this certain brand of products because they have made sustainability claims, that's an example of implied power platform. You know, the biggest one that I can showcase is Gwyneth Paltrow, and she clearly has a huge platform that she's trying to grow and has made some crazy claims that I outline in the book. Another one would be Food Babe, which I'm sure is um, not a popular amongst your listeners. She's growing a platform. She's actually out there trying to sell things with little expertise, but a lot of influence. And then the final one, and the one that perhaps is the easiest to pinpoint, is the implied power of product. Those are items whose claims, market share, labels give them implied power. So clearly, uh, food labels, menus, health stores, advertisements, more on social media are those that really try to influence people by making what I call BS claims or bull speak claims. And so in chapter 15 of the book, I actually laid out a number of the labels that have the defined meaning and what we should really be focusing on. And at the end of the day, I always advocate to go back to ask, is this food healthy and safe? Mm -hmm. Because those are our basic necessities. Right. So you have a food buying needs hierarchy that is compared to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if you could give us a, a verbal description of that, that would be helpful. So I know Maslow's hierarchy uh, sounds very psychological. I had to go back and refresh my own self on it, but it actually does a brilliant job of kind of looking at where we are on the whole food conversation. At the very base of the pyramid is nourishment. That is your most basic need. That should surpass all others. And then the next one is safety. And so clearly food safety is a part of that. And then the next two levels up are esteem and belonging. And belonging is where there's altruism, there's activism, there's tradition. And so the next level above that then is esteem. That's the prestige, affirmation, authority platform. And then the very top, the pinnacle of the pyramid is knowing that you're looking for self-actualization. Self-actualization is very hard to achieve. Very few people get there. But where the bully's target is right in the middle of the pyramid, esteem and belonging. So when you consider claims on food such as smart food, all natural, whole food, pesticide free, those are all esteem type of label claims. When you consider belonging label claims, it's things like ethical, farm raised, simple, 
clean, and so forth. But the point to consider here is that within our human needs, we always need to go back to nourishment and safety. Everything beyond that, quite frankly, I wouldn't worry about. Mm -hmm. And again, unless it's measurable, it's not meaningful because many people would try to make the case that nourishment would cover a lot of claims. But when those claims are scientifically invalid, it's a moot point. Right. I've talked on the show before about cultural cognition, where our food, just like our clothing and our cars and all of those types of things uh, is part of our identity. And so when it gets to that belonging and that that esteem, those levels of the pyramid, tradition, culture is part of that. And sometimes it can be hard to separate that if you don't see it for what it is. And I think one of the most helpful, and I know you have a lot of tips that you're going to share with us, but you had brought up the food labels so we could talk about that first. And I think one of the most helpful pieces of advice that you have is actually what to do with this food label. So I'd like you to address that, you know, these BS claims versus the accurate information on the label. Where do you find that? That is a great question. And I spent days and days researching to find the source. And I went through uh, 500 plus pages of FDA, USDA, and Food Safety Inspection Services labeling documents to try to decipher everything. And so some of the claims that we've already covered, such as clean and local and all natural and a superfood and healthful and whole and cleansing and sustainable, those are BS labels. There's no definition for most of those. Correct. They lack measure and they lack certification. So for example, the USDA organic label is a regulated, meaningful label for those that choose to purchase organic. My hope would be that people understand that it is a production style, it's not a health claim, but it is a meaningful label because it's measured. Another one that's actually coming by 2022 is the BE label that's bioengineered, and that's basically just showing any bioengineering that's happened, which if you're scared of that, I would encourage you to look up bioengineering because it's amazing, precise technology that's happening at such a finite level, it's kind of Mm mind-boggling. And so we've already talked about organic. Then the other label claims have to do with calories, which I know gets into your world, and sugars and fats and sodium. And then I got into some of the heart check certifications and the whole grain stamps so that people had, again, that nourishment or nutrition information that's at the bottom of their food buying needs. So essentially, I not want to put words in your mouth, but this is what I tend to revert back to and what I advise people. And it sounds like what you're saying is kind of take the front of the package claims at face value, turn the product around and look at the nutrition facts panel. Yes, exactly. And I know you're a huge fan of the nutrition facts label, Melissa, and I actually went through and explained the entire nutrition facts label. And what I always encourage people to is don't buy for adjectives. Don't pay for what's on the front of the package. Look for the information that's irrefutable. That's not marketing. And frankly, the nutrition facts label and the facts up front label, which is the the quick synopsis of what's on the back are the things that you need to be looking at. Now, the exception to that, of course, is if you have any food allergies, because I actually was shocked. I had a couple of examples handed to me by people who suffer from severe food allergies, life-threatening. And they told me stories about how they have been bullied at work by coworkers who think that food allergies are a joke. Hmm. Uh, So there is is no doubt that the allergens and the required claims are important for the 32 million people in America that do have food allergies. That's like the big eight, I think. It's like soy and peanuts and... I don't remember them all, but... Milk, egg, fish, crustacean shellfish, tree nuts, wheat, peanuts, and soybeans. I only know that because they're in the book. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's top of mind for you, right. And so that could be on the front of pack, but they still want to check the fine print. Before we transition into some more of the tips and advice that you have for people, I'm just curious what your take is on this. I mean, obviously, marketing isn't going anywhere anytime soon. And you brought up the fact that farmers are really 
under hard times now. Their profit margins are very small. And if consumers are saying they're going to buy X and not Y, then their hands are kind of tied. They have to provide X. People are shopping with their forks and their their dollars. But do you think this is ever going to go away until we can somehow level the playing field so that even within a certain food group, one chicken is saying no antibiotics ever, and then the others don't have antibiotics either. Is that ever going to go away? Is that ever going to change? I don't know, but I sure hope so. And not that I hold FDA entirely accountable for it, but there are examples of FDA that have been working on this for decades, and it's still not under control. And I think it's fascinating from the regulatory standpoint when you look what is done. And I still trust FDA, USDA, EPA, because they are the agencies that protect our food. But at the end of the day, I think manufacturers, retailers, uh, restaurants, and consumers all have to take responsibility for this. The same for farmers. We have to take responsibility for continuing to produce food in the safest manner that we know possible. I just don't understand why it's become okay to shame people around food in today's incredibly sensitive society. Why is it okay for one parent to be made to feel bad because they can't afford a certain brand of bag when they take school snacks in? Or another example of parental food shaming that happened was a mom was no longer allowed to make snacks because she wouldn't promise that she was using all all organic ingredients. You know, food is food. And you're not better than I am because you choose food differently than me. And I'm not better than you because I know how food is produced. It takes this continuous conversation. Whether or not food bullying will go away, I think we first have to recognize that it has become an epidemic. There is a social problem around food today, and it is unquestionably impacting family farmers all across this country. Which is a very serious issue. And you talk about who the food bullying impacts, who is most vulnerable and or when are we the most vulnerable? Can you talk a little bit about some of the different stages in life or diet needs that can really lead us down to this food bullying cycle? Sure. I cover a number of different types of folks that are susceptible to food bullying. I mean, it affects us all. Yes. There's some that are really more targeted. I cover a number of folks that are really impacted by bullying on my new food bullying podcast, which I would invite you all to listen to when you get a chance. But really, when you consider major life transitions, so clearly pregnancy is a huge one for any woman who's ever been pregnant. You can attest to that. Perhaps it's a moving your senior parent into a facility or perhaps it's when a student goes off to college for the first time. Likewise, when somebody's diagnosed for cancer or with cancer, there's clearly a great deal of susceptibility to bullying with any type of significant illness. And those are the times when, unfortunately, the fear goes through the ceiling and the bullying seems to skyrocket. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of health halos that are used to sell food today, that aren't necessarily true. Right. And you talk about fear is easy to sell, science isn't. So let's talk about managing all of this information and information literacy. What are some tips that you have or insight about how we can be able to locate, evaluate, and effectively use this food information? Well, it's interesting when you consider information literacy, in my mind, that has to precede critical thinking. And the reason why is that we have information coming at us nonstop. It's a very noisy world, and there's a tremendous amount of misinformation. Studies have clearly shown that our brain will continue to gravitate towards the misinformation. We'll hold that misinformation if there is a gap and new information isn't provided. So as far as information literacy, in my research, what I found is that you have to first identify the information you need then you have to find it effectively and efficiently, then you critically evaluate it, apply it, and then of course you have to acknowledge it. And the Socrates quote I think that rings very true is to assume you know little or nothing. There's an interesting example in the book out of the UK actually about bicycles and they handed people a drawing of a partial bike 
And very few people could actually identify where the pedals and everything went on the bike. It's that familiarity that we assume with everyday objects that we often don't have. And the same is true when we're making eating choices. We assume that we have familiarity because perhaps we read one article. When in fact, if you haven't really read an article, let's take antibiotics, for example, used in trying to help animals on the farm. If you've read one article and that article claimed that animal agriculture is responsibility for antibiotic resistance, that's probably the information you're going to hold on to. As such, you're going to go to the grocery store and you're going to gravitate to any package that says antibiotic free. Even though all milk and all meat that you are buying in the grocery store that's USDA grade A or stamped is not allowed to have antibiotics in it. There's certain minimal levels that are required or the, the meat or milk wouldn't be sold. But because you read that one article and perhaps didn't continue reading to understand the fact that animal agriculture is not necessarily responsible for antibiotic resistance, and there's a number of studies out there, and I would also put the caveat on that, that we don't know everything that's causing antibiotic resistance in humans, but statistically, it's impossible for animal agriculture to be solely responsible for it. So again, that information literacy is about stepping back, taking a look at the big picture and talking with people with firsthand experience. If you truly have an, a concern around antibiotics, great. Talk to a farmer. Come ask why we use them, how we use them. Talk to a veterinarian and understand the full picture before making the judgment. Right. You mentioned critical thinking and the bicycle example. And I recently interviewed Dr. Jason Reese about critical thinking and behavior change. And he shares that same bicycle example, how, yeah, we might be familiar with something and not realize that we don't really fully understand the mechanism, nor do we actually need to. But that sort of self-awareness that we don't know everything, I think is, is a really good starting place to be open to learning more information to kind of fill in the gaps and identifying our own personal bias. Yeah. And I just want to add to that because the Dunning-Kruger effect actually goes hand in hand with that. And that's where people who have little expertise or ability assume that they actually are superior in the area. And the Dunning-Kruger effect really leads bullies to embarrass others because they assume their knowledge is superior. And I think it's really interesting to consider that because I've witnessed a tremendous amount of Dunning-Kruger effect online where people assume that perhaps they know everything about the most contentious topics, for example, GMOs, when in fact they have little familiarity. Right. I'm glad you brought that up. And yeah, a lot of this bullying goes on online, social media, for sure, even within my own profession. So along those lines of critical thinking and overcoming bullying, you have one simple question that you want people to kind of take a step back and ask. So let's talk about that. Yes. Yeah, so the simple question I would like for people to ask as a fear filter is why? Why are they making that claim? Why does that matter to you? Why is that nutritionally relevant? Why is that more important than is this food safe and nutritious? And so the whole point is the why fear filter is kind of the anti-bullying fear filter that I suggest, particularly when you're having tough conversations about eating choices. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to give everything from the book away, but you also lay out five overall strategies for overcoming bullying. Um, we talked about some of these already, like ignoring some of those BS claims and looking at where we know the real facts are on the nutrition facts label. Also understanding the journey, finding out more about agriculture. You know, there's a lot of negative documentaries or shockumentaries uh, that you may have seen on YouTube or Netflix. Um, and again, that's when you would want to ask, why are these people, oftentimes activists, portraying information in, in this manner? And you also talked about getting to know the people, going and talking to farmers and veterinarians firsthand, which is not always the easiest thing to do, but I think it's becoming more accessible. 
Farmers certainly understand the importance of that, and not everybody can come to a farm, but there are ways that we can kind of bring the farm to people through credible videos and credible documentaries. But talk a little bit about standing up to bullies and making your own decisions. Those are the other two that we haven't touched on. Well, and just to touch on getting to know the people, seven out of 10 Americans believe it's important to know farmers who produce their food. So I really hope that this book will help connect more of those. And then as far as standing up to the bullies, again, people are often scared because a food claim is communicated to create an extreme emotional response. And again, if you step back and you ask why, the logical answer is because they want you to buy the food. And I would always go back and say, how does a celebrity, a wellness guru, a brand, a gym nutritionist know that their way is the right way? Right. I think it's really perplexing to me where it's so common for people to point the finger at the farmer. And when somebody like Gwyneth Paltrow is peddling whatever, to see a halo over her head. And so I think, to your point, asking why, because they have something to sell, it might seem like an altruistic thing. Oh, yes, it's all natural. It's this, it's that. But I'm just trying to help you. But those people are trying to sell something too. They are. And certainly the claim could be made that farmers are trying to sell something. However, when you take a look at the fact that farmers are out there producing food that they feed their families too, and that you farm out of a love for animals or the land or for feeding the world. I mean, those are the three reasons why you farm. And I think that what we have to remember is that we have to go back and find experts with firsthand expertise in order to stand up to the bullies. More often than not, when it comes to food, that's people like yourself, registered dietitian, nutritionists, food scientists, or farmers. And then I think that we also have to give some credibility to holding people responsible for making their own decisions. Let me ask you this, Melissa, have you been pressured into group think by your friends at some point, whether it's around food or clothes or going out to a certain establishment? Of course. Yeah. I mean, we all have, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that when it comes to food, no one should be dictating what's right for your family. Who's not a part of your family. And if you can define your own health, ethical, environmental, and social standards. And that doesn't mean you have to sit down and write a book about it. It just (laughs) means that you need to know what your standards are and measure all food claims against those standards. Then you won't fall prey to the bull speak claims and behaviors that are out there. Right. And you really lay that out step by step in the book. Like I said, it'll probably show up on my doorstep tomorrow, but the extensive information that I have with the overview has a lot of real specific strategies, walking people through determining and discovering their own values. And so I really encourage people to check that out because I do think that it's important. And in the spirit of elevating the food conversation, you had mentioned dietitians, farmers, other science experts, you know, we have learned that we can't just combat food bullying with facts. You know, we've learned to listen better to try to think more critically ourselves and to try to have more productive conversations. So hopefully that will pave the way for more of an open dialogue moving forward. Yeah, I think that there's an opportunity in today's food world to make a substantial difference if we choose to. I would encourage any dietitian that's listening, if you have a question about some claim that's been made about how food is raised, contact me. I will be at Fincy. I will be available online and we can connect you with the people that can tell you why those practices are used. But the other piece of this for the average everyday listener who's not a dietitian that's out there buying food and is worried about trying to do the right thing for their family is knowing what your story is. And one of the last examples I shared in the book, which was probably the hardest example that I wrote because it was deeply personal, was my own food story. And, you know, I grew up a dairy farm girl and I loved those cows and that farm no longer exists today. And I have been through a lot of heartbreak in agriculture. But what I realized throughout the course of my career and getting to know dietitians like you and others in the food arena 
is that we do need to understand that there is a very robust story out there and that one singular story doesn't define food for everyone. So these standards that I talked about are really about trying to understand what your own food story is and you creating that story through your health, ethical, environmental, and social standards rather than allowing others to create it for you and make you feel bad about your eating choices. Yes, I think it's really important to reassure people and going back to that food buying needs hierarchy, like Maslow's hierarchy is we have a safe, nourishing food supply. And beyond that, we have choices. And let's hope we continue to have all of the choices. And some of those choices don't get taken away. And at the top of that pyramid, that self-actualization, you said, is knowing the source, the science, and the system. So could you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Knowing the source, science, and system was actually a continuation from my second book, Food Truths from Farm to Table. I hold pretty firm to the belief that if you want the self-actualization, which again, very few people will reach, I would imagine many in the registered dietitian world would like to reach that. But knowing the source is about knowing where the food comes from. Knowing the system is knowing the regulatory system that's in place to keep our food safe. While it's not perfect, we have the most safe food of anywhere in the world by far. Then knowing the science is clearly knowing the science behind your food, knowing why We do use preservatives, knowing the science behind things like GMOs and knowing the science of certain farming practices, because our food is truly an amazing science and it's science that's changing every day and improving every year. Amen. So tell everybody where they can find out more information about the book and your speaking circuit and your podcast. Thank you for bringing that up. I was going to give you a shout out on that because you just recently launched the Food Bullying Podcast. Of course, I'll have all the links to everything in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com, but give everybody some information on where they can get the book and find out more information. My website is causematters.com. You can purchase the book there if you would like a signed copy or if you can remember foodbullying.com, it's the same link. I will also be at Fency for anybody who's attending in 2019. The Food Bullying Podcast just launched, and we had some fascinating guests, a neuroscientist that actually shows how people process information about food, a hunger advocate, farmers, moms, dietitians, of course. So I would invite you to listen to that on any of the podcast channels. Uh, You can find it at foodbullyingpodcast.com. And finally, on social media, I am at M. Payne Speaker, S-P-E-A-K-E-R. I would love to connect with you there. And again, if you have any questions about why food is being raised the way it is, please do reach out to me. And my hope is, is that food bullying will help you elevate the conversation and protect more people from the bullies on the food playground. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And you mentioned Fency a couple of times, and this episode is airing right before Fency. So um, yeah, if you're at Fency, find Michelle. She's got her pre-release party going on at the Common Ground booth and also at the Build Up Dietitians event. So shout out for that. The book officially releases November 5th, but like I said, I pre-ordered mine and, and you've got some copies to give out too, so people can get that. Is there anything else you wanted to share in wrapping up that we didn't touch on? I mean, I know there's a ton of stuff in the book. We can only cover a certain amount, but is there anything else you'd like to say in wrapping up? I would just like to say thank you to the dietitians out there that have taken the time to get to know how food is produced and for any consumers likewise. I certainly respect and admire people who have an open mind. And my hope is that food bullying will shed some light and up in people's way of thinking about food because it's about time that we celebrate and not condemn food. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Michelle. It's been a pleasure talking with you as always. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind and no more food bullying. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke.